If you'd like a chance to win a physical copy of Sonic Superstars, stay tuned to the end of this video. Please don't skip! Hey everyone, Skull902 here, and this year marks the 30th anniversary of Sonic the Hedgehog CD. With its explorative level design and time travel gimmick, this game became a cult favorite and one of the few Sega CD titles that garnered a positive reception. One thing the game is remembered for is bringing about the debuts of cybernetic doppelganger Metal Sonic, as well as the subject of today's video, Amy Rose. Despite being one of the big five main characters of the franchise, and getting high results in popularity polls, usually around fifth and first among the female characters, attitudes toward her are actually fairly divisive in the fanbase. Amy, along with Sonic, is my personal favorite character in the series and, to celebrate her 30th anniversary, I thought it'd be fun to take a dive into her character writing over the years, because depending on the writer, we've gotten some wildly different takes on her. So what I'm going to do is first take a look at her depictions in the classic series, how it evolved in the Sonic Adventure series to serve as the basis of her personality from that point on, and then see how that's changed over time with what I consider to be the three biggest influences of those changes, Sonic X, Sonic Boom, and the IDW Sonic comic. Other media, such as the manga in which Amy's prototype debuted or the Archie comic, I don't believe really shaped her character in the games that much, if at all, so we won't be taking a look at those. With all that said, let's get started. Amy Rose was created by Kazuyuki Hoshino after Sega held an internal contest to create a female counterpart to Sonic, using Mickey and Minnie Mouse as a reference for what they were looking for. Instead, the development team of Sonic CD thought it'd be more interesting, and in line with Sonic's character, to make the relationship one-sided. Although Amy was described as energetic and easygoing with an interest in mysticism, particularly fortune-telling and card rating, up until the late 2010s it was mostly just treated as flavor for manuals and not really showcased in-game like her crush on Sonic was. Honestly, Amy wasn't even really much a part of the central cast back then either, usually just filling up a slot when needed for multiplayer games. So, unless you actually read the Japanese manual for Sonic CD, all you could reasonably guess about her was that she was a girl infatuated with Sonic who didn't really reciprocate. In my opinion, Amy's personality and character were really solidified when the Japanese continuity took priority in Sonic Adventure. Amy's journey in the first Sonic Adventure is a story about coming into her own as a hero. She reminisces about the old days with Sonic, bored with her everyday life, until a flicky happens to collide with her, roping her into the story when it becomes apparent that E100 Zero is after the bird. Amy might be inexperienced, but she's not going to let this poor creature be hurt. At first she seeks out Sonic for help and gets distracted with a promotion at Twinkle Park due to her crush on him, but after she's taken prisoner by Zero, she meets Gamma and manages to convince him to let her and the Flicky go, managing to see the potential in him to do good despite his programming. This marks an important turning point, first shown when she stands up to Sonic during his fight with Gamma, and commented on after she lands safely in Station Square with Tails. From then on, she displays a more take-charge, proactive attitude about her task, facing her fear when Zero strikes the Flicky and putting the evil robot out for good, after which she displays full confidence in her abilities, and promises to prove herself to Sonic one day. Despite not being a playable character in the second game, we see some of the same traits in Sonic Adventure 2 as well. She's not overly clingy to Sonic, only really letting her crush be shown when she stupidly mistakes Shadow for him, which is a problem not exclusive to her in this game, and a pretty natural reaction to when the blue blur gets shot into space and presumably blown up. Amy rescues Sonic from his prison with an assist from Tails, and gives Shadow the same treatment she gave Gamma, showing him that the world was full of good people and worth saving. Some detractors might point to her Will You Marry Me line from the prison rescue scene, but I think the intent there was that she was joking. We've seen enough to know she wouldn't leave anyone, much less one of her friends, behind like that. So what we get in these two games is a character who's sweet, willing to unselfishly help those in need, wears her heart on her non-existent sleeve, stands up for her beliefs even if it means butting heads with her friends, is a capable hero, and more importantly has a deep level of understanding in seeing the good in people that others might dismiss or give up on. She's the heart and caretaker of the team, and in my opinion is Amy Rose at her best. This would be the depiction of her character that everything else bases theirs on, so let's see how the producers of Sonic X ran with it and influenced her writing in future games. Sonic X, celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, is a show that doesn't have terribly great writing in my opinion. The overall plot isn't very good, and the characters, oh boy. Along with Knuckles, I believe Amy got the worst treatment of the game characters in this show. Most of the time, she's overly angry, overly obsessive with Sonic, bossy and selfish. As mentioned before, I think she was portrayed pretty excellently in Sonic Adventure 2, so let's use a moment from the show's adaptation of that game as an example. 
She and Tails are flying the prison island to rescue Sonic. Tails is trying to be careful about it, but Amy just wants to rush in Hammer first and get Sonic out of there. She basically yells at him to hurry the fuck up and get in closer so she can get a move on. Poor Tails, in exasperation, makes a little justified comment under his breath about her behavior, to which the Pink Hedgehog responds, What did you say? in a manner clearly meant to intimidate. This is a small sample of how she acts in most of the show. In the third season, it gets just a little bit worse when it becomes apparent that she's more so motivated by impressing Sonic than actually doing what's right, which the first two seasons at least showed her doing frequently enough. Some might make the argument that it's simply the English version and that the Japanese original is much better. I personally beg to differ. Aside from the last two episodes, the show didn't really change much storytelling-wise between both languages. Sometimes one version would tone Amy's worst traits down while the other amped them up and vice versa. For instance, in episode 42, which is a pretty bad episode all around for characterization, she threatens to beat the shit out of Chris in an attempt to get Sonic to speak with her in the original, whereas in the English version, she instead accuses Chris of keeping Sonic's whereabouts a secret while going on her temper tantrum. Conversely, the Japanese version of episode 45 actually has a rather sweet little scene where Ella and Mr. Tanaka prop her up after calming her down from another tantrum, ending on a fun little bit where Amy acknowledges Sonic is free like the wind and wonders if she'll be able to catch him, only to immediately see him in the window. In English, however, she instead tries to dismiss Sonic entirely before the window bit. Also, she was far more of a dick to Mr. Tanaka before calming down, and that just won't fly in this house. To the show's credit, however, they generally do a great job with moments that are supposed to be emotional or impactful, many of which involve Amy acting more or less the way she does in the games that inspired it. We have Episode 9 where her motivations are driven by her love for Sonic, but she genuinely wants to help him be less afraid of the water, or the iconic moment from Episode 52, or saving Sonic in Episode 76 despite being told the situation was helpless by her friends because they and the universe needed him and it was the right thing to do. There's a couple more, but it's stuff like this that just makes me wish the show as a whole could have been written this way. So, after all of that, what influence did it have on the games? Her personality in the games that followed was inconsistent but more balanced in that regard as well. We have Heroes where she's only really out to marry Sonic, brings up that intimidating tone when Cream suggests that he might not reciprocate, or outright blaming Eggman for being the reason she and Sonic aren't together, her improvement in ability apparently coming at the cost of her characterization. How about Sonic Battle? There's a bit of an arc about her working to improve her health, but then most of her scenes are her trying to force the idea on Emerald and Sonic that the former is now their adopted child so they can practice parenting. In Rush, Amy gets upset and chases Cream around with her hammer just because the rabbit said her priorities might not be in order, growing suspicious of Blaze for the high crime of being a girl who might want to speak with Sonic. On the flip side, we have games like Shadow the Hedgehog, where she's probably got the least selfless mission of any side character, wanting to find Cream and Cheese to make sure they're safe after they wandered into a spooky castle. She's generally one of the better written characters in 06, barring that one line. If I had to choose between the world and Sonic, I would choose Sonic! She apologizes to Silver for tripping him up and promises to make it right by helping him out, standing in his way and putting herself in danger when it becomes apparent that his mission is to kill Sonic. Later on, after rescuing Elise, she's shown to be very supportive of the princess's romantic aspirations, even if she's unaware that Elise also has a hankering for Hedgehog Dick. And then there's Sonic Unleashed. While Amy's probably the least prominent of the main characters in the game, she has a couple great little moments, again apologizing to Sonic in his werehog form when she hadn't yet realized it was him and after finding out, she has a bit of dialogue about accepting him no matter what because his looks don't change the fact that he's a great person inside, though all of her hub dialogue is optional, and at the end of the game, never giving up on hope that Sonic can get the job done, telling Professor Pickle she knew he had it in him all along after the day is saved. The last game I believe X had any influence on the writing was Sonic and the Black Knight. Her Arthurian counterpart Nemu was done very well in my opinion, and Amy herself has a vocal cameo after the credits where she's pretty reasonably annoyed at Sonic for missing their date and not buying into his reasons, but then also giving him the hammer chase afterward. A weird but fittingly mixed depiction of her character, as if it were a microcosm of this era as a whole. In 2010, Sega decided to overhaul the creative side of the Sonic series with a huge tonal shift. Stories were now simpler, with less character focus, instead emphasizing comedy. Amy became something of a one-track character in her first two appearances after the shift, and they're both bad depictions for different reasons. In Sonic Freeriders, they decided to make her Bitches Maximus. Hard to argue this being her worst in-game portrayal, with her constant belittlement and ungratefulness toward her teammates. In Sonic Generations, her appearance, much like most of the cast, is very limited and she uses hers to constantly gush about Sonic or try to sneak bear hugs on him. Knocking out Knuckles with ease was kinda funny though. 
Afterward, Sega went in a different direction with her character, as shown in Sonic Lost World. That game is pretty terrible writing-wise, featuring the beginning of Tails' descent, but Amy actually had it pretty good here considering the lack of screen time she and Knuckles have. She's very sweet and caring to the animals, gives Sonic updates when needed, and treats her feelings for him very subtly. Well done. It seems to me like they had the writers of Sonic Boom go in this direction as well. Amy's generally very nice and considerate, a bit neat and proper, but also actually gets an opportunity to get into the fight. Just about the only differences I can think of is that she talks about gender equality sometimes and her crush on Sonic is an outright secret, which they do portray as a bit creepy sometimes, but in those cases it's the punchline of a joke, not a core part of her character. Since Boom was mostly episodic and had a simple, comedic focus, there isn't really much more to discuss. Only one game featuring Amy came out between Boom's premiere and the IDW comic's first true issue, Sonic Forces. In it, they continue the trend of giving Amy these good characteristics, along with a heightened sense of responsibility as the organizer of the Resistance. With the odd exception of this single line that harkens back to her obsess over Sonic portrayal, and the fact that they didn't really know what to do with her or any of the non-playable characters at the end of the game, it was pretty good for what little we got. And that's kind of the thing, eh? They had the foundation there, but Sega was so afraid of using most of the cast for so long, it feels more like an asterisk than a truly great portrayal of the character. However, half a year after Force's release, the IDW comic had its proper debut, and they made sure to give the game characters not named Sonic some time to shine. Now, before I get into Amy's characterization in IDW, my thoughts on it and the comic in general, for transparency's sake I do have a line of contact with someone who works on the comics, so please do keep that in mind. Making her full debut in the comic's second issue, Amy has a fantastic introduction with some great moments and fun dialogue, getting to kick some ass with Sonic. Throughout the series, she's largely been depicted well in my opinion. She shows great leadership qualities such as shouldering the heft of the Restoration's responsibilities while she was in charge, resourcefully recruiting the Babylon Rogue's help in the Metal Virus Saga, and strategizing the battle plan during the Imperial City story. Her sweet, caring nature is one of her most often displayed traits, for example taking care of Silver and comforting Cream and Tails, as well as her concern over Sonic's condition during the Metal Virus arc, taking Jewel, Tangle, and Bell on the camping trip with the intent of giving them a break from their troubles, reassuring Bell during the card reading, apologizing for things going the way they did despite it not being her fault, or in the fourth storyline where she immediately checks up on Sonic after coming in with the others, apologizes for breaking the Miles Electric when Tangle spooked her, getting Rouge to give the Echidna artifact to her so she can take it back to Angel Island, and sympathizing with Knuckles due to his isolation, expressing concern for him being all alone and offering him a place in Restoration HQ if he needs a break, and appreciating his trust as well. She even hesitates to get in her first fight of the second storyline because she doesn't want to take any credit for it. Like for real, what a sweetheart. That's not to say she's a slouch in battle though, quite the opposite. Along with her debut, she saves Cream and most of the non-infected at Restoration HQ when it was breached, and took part in the evacuations during the Metal Virus Saga. Though attacking Zomom at a bad time seemed uncharacteristically impulsive, helped shut down Clutch's operations in the Chow races, which I'll get back to later, fought along Sonic and Tails in the testing chambers, pledges to do all she can to fight the forest fire and does just that, and stalls Metal Sonic and Eggman at different points during the Imperial City story, one moment in particular in those issues that caused a bit of discourse was her taking the giant Badnik's equally giant hammer and clobbering it. Honestly, I rather liked it. It felt to me like Amy had to really dig deep in order to do it, and she's very exhausted after the fact. Gives me the impression that she really doesn't know her own strength unless the situation calls for it. I'm reminded of Minako from Sailor Moon and how she can just do something like jump from the street to a balcony without even having to transform. All this combined has led to a positive reception for Amy's character in the comics, some of whom had disliked the character before. One thing I see all too often is some people claiming IDW finally made her good, which, even if that wasn't a repeat of what some had to say about her in Boom, I gotta heavily disagree with. These traits had all been there before, it's not like the comic writers invented her personality. Another take on it I disagree with is the idea that she's been written perfectly. Sorry bro, but that ain't true either. Some criticisms I have relating to that are how she didn't do much in the final fight of the Neo Metal Sonic arc despite having a cool hype-up moment with Team Sonic immediately beforehand, or how all the good stuff she did in Imperial City is kinda undermined when she's somehow incapacitated without even taking a direct hit, almost as if they wanted to call back to Sonic X on that one. But those are small potatoes compared to two weird missteps in the second and third storylines. Throughout the Metal Virus Saga, Amy loses confidence in her abilities as a leader. It's built up over plenty of issues, and Jewel eventually offers to help her with the restoration, to which Amy happily agrees. 
At first it seems like the plan is for Jewel to tackle the paperwork while Amy takes the role of a field commander, but when Eggman attacks and Whisper asks Amy for orders, she just throws Jewel under the bus, essentially going, she's the leader now, ask her for orders. Vector and Tails are left to pick up the pieces afterward. Not only was that a wasted opportunity to get Amy's confidence back up, but the heroes know by that point that Jewel's a complete worrywart, not to mention her total lack of battle experience, so it feels kinda cruel. The confidence arc unceremoniously ended in only a few panels during her fight against Clutch's machine, giving herself the most minimal of pep talks and then boom, back to her old self. I feel like it could have been played out over the course of two or three battles, really build it up, you know? The other big one is when she publicly pressures Jewel into making a plan to fight the fire during the camping trip. It's worded sweetly and all, but again, Jewel's so anxious and being put on the spot like that? Not the greatest of looks. However, these things thankfully are exceptions to the rule, and I think Amy's depiction in IDW is very true to the good examples of her character set before then. Sega seems to have taken a cue from her writing there and usually depicts her as such on their social media. Taking another step in this direction, they straight up hired comic writer Ian Flynn to write Sonic Frontiers, released last year. Amy is your companion on Kronos Island, where she displays her good traits. The first thing she does upon being reawakened is check up on Sonic to see if he's alright, she comforts and looks after the Coco, even standing up to Sonic on their behalf when he suggests shifting focus from taking care of them. She gives Sage a talking to as well when the latter tells Sonic that saving his friends is a fruitless endeavor. When the hedgehogs are flashed back to the moment two ancients embrace and die together, it hits Amy hard and inspires her to try and spread that love to the world. Later in the game, she also sacrifices her freedom with Knuckles and Tails, sending themselves back into cyberspace to break Sonic out of stasis. Plus she does that silly little run. For real though, just about the only weird thing here is, for all the great emotional dialogue in the game, not once do Sonic and Amy talk about her feelings for him. In the Sonic Twitter takeover shortly after the game was released, they even depict it as if her crush on him is a secret, like in Sonic Boom. So that's a bit peculiar. It doesn't stop her from giving him a big hug at the end, and hey, he even reciprocates, which I think is a big show of growth for both characters. Some fans got up in arms about the Fast Friends Forever description of Amy saying she doesn't chase Sonic around anymore, but if you look at just this little moment, it really shows what that statement means. Amy's learned to settle herself down a bit, and conversely it's helping Sonic appreciate her just a little more, not being weirded out or scared into fleeing. They're not suppressing her feelings for him entirely, she's just expressing them in a less assertive way. We've seen this in the IDW comics as well, and in my opinion is a natural evolution for their characters. Good stuff. Amy Rose is a character that's experienced many ups and downs. In her worst depictions, she's obsessive and clingy towards Sonic, she's overly angry and intimidates her friends, she's rude and selfish, it all just comes across as a shallow stereotype. But not only do the good depictions outnumber the bad ones, in my opinion they outweigh the negatives by a wide margin. Amy Rose, in her good depictions, is one of the best characters in the franchise. She's kind and considerate, always putting the needs of others before herself. Her compassion and understanding of people is unparalleled, being able to get through to those that others would have long given up on. She's energetic and cheerful, unafraid of expressing her feelings, but she doesn't use them to antagonize others. She can be level-headed and reasonable, but also isn't immune to acting on her emotions, taking risks, or making mistakes and getting herself into trouble as a result. She's an exceptional hero, even being given a little character arc showing her improvement and adaptive skills in that department. She's committed and can be depended on for anything, whether it's bashing bad guys or doing something nice to cheer her friends up. Like I stated earlier, she truly is the heart, the caretaker of the team because of how unique her level of empathy is among the other heroes. Not that the others don't possess those qualities. A good comparison I've made is that whereas Sonic might save someone, make sure they're okay, give them some encouragement if needed and set off for his next adventure, Amy would be more likely to save someone, make sure they're okay and stick around to get to know them better and ensure they'll still be alright after she leaves. That is Amy Rose to me, and it makes her one of my favorites not only in the Sonic franchise but in all of fiction, and I'm glad that seems to be the direction Sega wants to take with her because after all the inconsistency and divisive fan reaction, it's what she really deserves. Thanks for watching. Feel free to let me know what you thought about the video in the comments. Give it a like if you liked it, or a dislike if you didn't. If you'd like to see more, subscribe and click the bell for notifications. It's free and you can opt out anytime. Here's a playlist with similar content and my Twitter. I have been Skull902, thank you again for watching, and have yourselves a wonderful day. Thanks for sticking to the very end.
or skipping here most likely, let's be real. If you're interested in winning a physical copy of Sonic Superstars, please consider donating $40 to my Extra Life page, linked down below. This will enter you into a raffle to win the game for your console of choice, and the drawing will take place on November 5th. Even if you don't win, you'll also be entered into raffles for other cool Sonic and Mario related prizes, which will be announced in a later video. It all goes toward helping kids in need. Thanks for your consideration.